On April 29, 1958, Michelle Marie Pfeiffer was born in Santa Ana, California, the second child of Richard Pfeiffer, an air conditioning contractor, and Donna Jean Pfeiffer, who was born Donna Jean Tiverna, who was a housewife. The family moved to Midway City in Orange County, where Pfeiffer spent her early years. Pfeiffer attended Fountain Valley High School, graduating in 1976. After training to be a court stenographer, she decided upon an acting career. She made her debut in 1978, appearing in an episode of Fantasy Island. Other TV roles followed, including Delta House, Chips, Enos, and Bad Cats. She transitioned to comedy with The Hollywood Nights, which aired in 1980, starring Tony Danza. Pfeiffer appeared in a commercial for Lux Soap, and appeared in three TV movies in 1981, Callie and Son, The Children Nobody Wanted, and Splendor in the Grass. Pfeiffer obtained her first major film role as the female lead in Grease 2, which was released in 1982 and was also the sequel to Grease. The film was a critical and commercial failure, but Pfeiffer escaped the critical mauling, and director Brian De Palma saw Grease 2, cast her as the cocaine-addicted trophy wife Elvira Hancock in Scarface, uh, actually the remake of Scarface, which was released in 1983. The movie was a commercial hit and gained a large cult following in subsequent years. Following Scarface, she played Diana in John Landis's Into the Night, released in 1984, and was also in Lady Hawk, which was released in 1985, with Rutger Hauer and Matthew Broderick. She also appeared as the actress Faith Healy in Alan Alda's Sweet Liberty, released in 1986, and Brenda Landers in the segment of the 1950s sci-fi parody Amazon Women on the Moon, which was released in 1987. Pfeiffer next played a murdered gangster's widow in Jonathan Demme's comedy Married to the Mob, released in 1988. She received her first Golden Globe nomination as Best Actress in a Motion Picture Musical or Comedy, beginning a six-year streak of consecutive Best Actress nominations at the Golden Globes. She next appeared in Tequila Sunrise, also released in 1988, with Mel Gibson and Kurt Russell, and at Dem's personal recommendation, she joined the cast of Dangerous Liaisons, also released in 1988, with Glenn Close and John Malkovich. Pfeiffer then played a former call girl in The Fabulous Baker Brothers, released in 1989, a role which earned her critical acclaim. In 1990, Pfeiffer formed her own film production company, Via Rose Productions, which was under a production deal with Touchstone Pictures, which was a division of Disney. That year, uh, she uh, began earning $1 million per film and took the part of the Soviet book editor Kataya Orlova in the film adaptation of John Le Carre's The Russia House, released in 1990, a role that required her to adopt a Russian accent. She then landed a role as a damaged waitress in Gary Marshall's Frankie and Johnny, released in 1991, a film that reunited her with her Scarface co-star Al Pacino. I acquired this DVD from Amazon for only $5.99, which is well below the self-imposed limit of $13.91. Uh, so even though the movie is available for free on Amazon Prime, uh, this DVD does qualify for a low-budget review. Sometimes you're really obnoxious. I'm just eager to go out with you. Paramount Pictures presents a love story. If you don't look, you stare. It makes me nervous. About a woman who wouldn't say yes. You don't know me. And a man. Chances like this don't come along often. Who wouldn't take no. She was just asking me out. Why are you doing this? Al Pacino. Everything I want is in this room. Michelle Pfeiffer. <laughs> Frankie and Johnny. Rated R. Starts Friday, October 11th at theaters everywhere. Frankie, who is played by Michelle Pfeiffer, a single waitress, attends her godson's baptism in her hometown of Altoona, Pennsylvania. 
In the meantime, a middle-aged man called Johnny, who's played by Al Pacino, is released from prison. Frankie travels via bus back to New York City, where she waitresses at the Apollo Cafe. When she returns, she buys a VCR, uh, so she can watch movies alone. Uh, the owner of the Apollo Cafe, Nick, who's played by Hector Elizondo, sends her co-worker Helen home because she complains of dizziness. Johnny arrives at the cafe looking for work, and Nick hires him as a short order cook, although he has a criminal record. Frankie returns home to her efficiency apartment and finds a stranger, Bobby, who is played by Sean O'Brien, which is his film debut, installing shells, but he is revealed to be the boyfriend of her friend and neighbor Tim, played by Nathan Lane. In the meantime, Johnny solicits a prostitute, but merely asks that she lie spoon to him. The next day, Nick says that Helen has been hospitalized. Frankie and her fellow waitress Cora, who's played by Kate Nelligan, visit Helen in the hospital in fear of dying alone like her. Uh, Johnny helps a man who had an epileptic seizure and asks Frankie out on a date, but Frankie refuses. Helen dies, and Frankie, Cora, and Netta, uh, who's uh, a co worker, played by Jane Morris, attend her funeral and are surprised to see Johnny there. Um, when Frankie asks about this, he explains that he had empathy for Helen, even though he never met her. He asks Frankie out again, and she refuses him again. He has a one-night stand with Cora, and she shares the details of this with Frankie and Netta. A few weeks later, one of the busboys at the Apollo Cafe has sold a script and is Hollywood bound. He's throwing a going away party and invites all his co-workers. Johnny asks Frankie to be his date at this party, but again she refuses. He shows up at her apartment anyway, where Bobby and Tim help Frankie to decide what to wear. They go to the party, where Johnny tries to convince Frankie that they are compatible. After the party, he buys her a corsage and persuades her to take him back to her apartment, where they consummate their relationship. Now apparently in love with Frankie, Johnny spends the day with her and shows up at her bowling night and professes his love to her. Uh, Frankie argues that he cannot love her after such a short time, and when Johnny mentions starting a family, she reveals that she cannot start a family. Uh, Frankie goes to a grocery store and confronts a woman who is beaten by her man and asks if, there any, is, if there's anything she can do about it. The woman says that she doesn't know what Frankie is talking about. Afterwards, Frankie avoids Johnny, uh, not answering his phone calls and switching shifts. But Johnny switches his shifts as well. On Saturday night, which um, is Frankie and Johnny are both working that night, Frankie asks Johnny if there's any secrets that he's keeping from her. Uh, Johnny confesses that he is divorced and has two children, which he's not seen since he got out of prison for check fraud, where he's read books and, and learned to cook. Uh, Frankie encourages him to see his children, and she confesses that her last boyfriend cheated on her with her, her best friend. After closing, the two walk home, and she claims that she introduced her boyfriend to her best friend, and that she lent him mo the money and uh, her TV set. At the apartment, the intimacy makes her nervous. They argue, and she asks Johnny to leave. But before he leaves, he calls the radio station they're listening to, and asks them to play an encore of Claire de Lune. Frankie shows Johnny a welt on the back of her neck that her boyfriend gave her by hitting her with a belt buckle. She admits that she had a miscarriage because of physical abuse from her boyfriend. She sulks for a moment, then emerges from the bathroom and opens the window to discover that the battered woman uh, has left her partner. Um, we see montages of people at the current time. Netta, alone, uh, Cora, who's with a one-night stand, Bobby and Tim, uh, Nick with his family, and back to Frankie and Johnny. Frankie confesses that she's actually 36 years old, and the couple go to bed together as the sun rises. I remember seeing a trailer for this movie over 30 years ago. I did not see the movie on its initial theatrical release. Apparently, I was not alone as the movie did not do well the movie was released on October 11, 1991, 
and finished third the week it was released, uh, grossing only $4.8 million that week. Its worldwide gross was uh, $67 million total, and since the budget was $29 million, it was easily profitable. In addition, the movie did well with critics, with a Rotten Tomatoes average of 6.7 um, on a scale of 1 to 10, and Peter Travers calling it the perfect love story released from the Times. And it is a movie that injects much realism in the story and character. It's, it is much more realistic, for example, than Pretty Woman, also directed by Gary Marshall, and for that reason, it was likely less popular than Pretty Woman. Uh, much was made in the casting of Michelle Viper and Al Pacino in this movie. The, the movie was adopted by Terrence McNally from his own off-Broadway play, Frankie and Johnny, in uh, The Claire de Lune, uh, which was staged in 1987. Uh, the play starred Kathy Bates and F. Murray Abraham. Yeah, both Michelle Pfeiffer and Al Pacino were considered by some to be too glamorous for these roles. Um, Pfeiffer's beauty is toned down to make her look as ordinary as possible, and to watch this movie you had to buy into Pfeiffer as a waitress with no prospects. But once you do, you'll find that Pfeiffer plays her role particularly well. Uh, some of the problems with the movie are that the movie is popular with cliches. For example, the gay buddy, the slutty waitress, the homely waitress, the Puerto Rican Lothario, the uh, Greek restaurant owner, and so on. A lot of this is from, from Terrence McNally's writing, uh, as he adopted from his, his, his stage play, and arguably from Gary Marshall. Um, it's, uh, it just seems like... Um, it may be stere um, a big idea to me, but it seems like a lot of like Gary Marshall uh, movies that are directed by him are, 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 uh, are, are uh, popular with cliches. Uh, but even so, a lot of the supporting actors steal the scenes they are in. And Pfeiffer and Pacino elevate any movie they are in. So in this case, the mediocre writing is enhanced by the acting. Uh, part of what makes John, uh, Frankie and Johnny interesting is the predicament of the central characters. Uh, take Frankie, for example. She's in her 30s, is single, and does not want to have children. She even buys a, a VCR so she can watch movies and not have to worry about finding a date. If only she looked now, easily binge watch on Netflix, engage in retail therapy on Amazon, and various e commerce sites she did. She'd be in her element now. And it's something that she has the right to do. Everyone has a prerogative to not have children. But it would be a shame if she didn't have children because of some obstacle, either real or perceived. And then we find out that she had a miscarriage as a result of physical abuse from her boyfriend. When she admits this, everything else starts to make sense. Uh, she uh, saw this woman being beaten by her partner, and she also, uh, in a supermarket, in a grocery store anyway, she tried to help the battered woman because she was physically abused herself. And this woman's rejection of her offer for help probably made her feel sad, as, as if she saw the futility of the situation. And then later on, when she found out that she had left her partner, um, she obviously felt pretty good. And at her age, the clock is ticking. Any pregnancy at age 35 or greater is considered an adequate risk of pregnancy. Also, trying to find a partner at her age can be a problem. By her own admission, she is 36 years old. And there's a big difference when you're, you're between when you're 26 and when you're 36. When you're younger, you have all your looks. Uh, this, this is like uh, one of the dilemmas of women um, that e either they at, at a certain age they decide that they're going to get married and have children or focus on their careers um, so um, you know, when, and you just said when you're younger you have all your looks, looks and men will want to date you when you're older you don't have your looks to the extent that you, you do when you're younger and you end up having to compete with the, all the younger women. 
Also, all the men your age that want to have a family are pretty much married with children at that age. 36 is not really considered old, but at that age, historically speaking, most women who want to have children have children. Um, and I, I can personally speak of, of somebody, uh, to a couple who were married in their 40s. Um, they got married, tried to have children, which again was difficult for the wife and his thing, like, you know, once, once they decide they want to have children, they're older, it becomes difficult. Uh, she took fertility drugs and had triplets. Needless to say, she seemed to have aged 10 years the last time I saw her. The other alternative to having a family is to find a fulfilling career, so that's another thing you can do. Um, if, you, if you don't want to have children, you can have a fulfilling career. But that doesn't seem to be an option for her, as she's a waitress, so I can see her frustration. Um, then you have the character Johnny. I gather his life as, as a professional was somewhat unsuccessful as he was arrested for check, check for us. So I'm guessing that probably they, um, if, if you're desperate enough to, to uh, commit check fraud, you probably aren't doing that well. Um, so he claims that his wife remarried and lives in the suburbs and that his family has a much better life than he would have been able to provide them. Um, so I'm just, I'm just inferring things. Um, his prison stint must have been like hitting the reset button on his life as he found he excelled at cooking and was able to, uh, to obtain some level of book smarts uh, from via deplorant inmate no less. Uh, as unlikely a character as he is, he and Frankie might be a match. He might be the square peg that fits into the square hole. Um, so it's kind of interesting, like, like uh, you know, the character of Frankie uh, is a bit odd, and, and he's a bit odd, so they, might, uh, they might be a fit. Um, oh, there's also, um, uh, so people who, who are, follow the career of Dee Dee Pfeiffer, who's the sister of um, Michelle Pfeiffer, the younger sister of Michelle Pfeiffer, um, she appears in a scene as, as Frankie's cousin. Um, we also see her in uh, Falling Down. She was like the, the fast the fast food worker, Miss Folsom. Um, so it's kind of interesting to see Dee Dee Pfeiffer here. Um, also, this movie is rated R for language and sexuality. Um, there are about 20 uses of the F word, but not nearly as many there are as most Al Pacino movies. There are also some sex scenes with very little nudity. There's a scene in which Frankie watches another woman beat by her, her, her boy, boyfriend or partner. It might be uh, her, his, her husband. We don't really know. Her, I, I guess it's basically like her partner. Uh, and there's a scene where Frankie talks about how he, she was beaten by her boyfriend while she was pregnant. Overall, the R rating, which may have been a, uh, a reason for the fact that it was only a moderate success upon release, uh, was justified by the content of the movie. It's always a dilemma where, you know, you know that, like, the commercially successful movies are going to be generally going to be, like, G and PG movies that you're going to take the kids to see. Um, if it's an R-rated movie, you know, it might work on a, 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 you know, it's an art house type movie, but uh, generally you're going to make less money, but it seems to be more or less justified the content of the movie. Uh, in, some, in summation, Frankie and Johnny is a flawed movie elevated by the presence of Michelle Pfeiffer and Al Pacino and the various supporting actors. It teaches an important lesson about having uh, emotional baggage from past relationships being an obstacle being an obstacle to establishing new ones and the importance of having some kind of goal in life. Uh, I saw this movie as the first time in over 30 years and was impressed. I saw it again and I was less impressed, but I still thought it was a good movie. For that reason, I give it a 7 out of 10. There isn't much to write home about as far as DVD extras are concerned. You can listen to the movie in 5.1 surround sound or Dolby 
I watched the movie with subtitles, uh, but only in English, no Spanish. Uh, there is this uh, theatrical trailer, and you can watch the entire movie or select scenes. Overall, I wasn't that impressed. You, you get as much from a VHS tape of the movie, or, or, or God forbid, a, a beta tape of the movie. I don't think that was existed at the time it was released, but anyway. Um, uh, but the sound setup was nice. Frankie and Johnny was a good movie as a flawed masterpiece, which I can heartily recommend. But the DVD extras were underwhelming. For this reason, I only slightly recommend this DVD. If you just want to see the movie, it's streaming for free on Amazon Prime. I think you can rent it from YouTube. But uh, yeah, there's some free options, and, uh, options where you can pay a small amount of money. So if you just want to see the movie, you can watch it there. So um, I only slightly recommend it. Well, that's it for this DVD review. I'm still thinking about the movie I'm going to do for next week's review. Uh, but I'm thinking that after a romantic, well, not really a comedy, but a romantic comedy drama like Frankie and Johnny, I may have to go to an action movie. So I purchased to Brooke. But that's probably not going to arrive. Uh, so I may have to do something for next week's movie. Uh, again, like the video and comment on it and hit the subscribe button to be informed of the latest low-budget review. As always, thanks for watching.